Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So for today's video it's going to be slightly different, and for the people that want to look at some of the beautiful plants in the collection and I talk about my experiences with those plants, this is not one for you. I will put a link here for the review series of plants, and I will also put a link for my tips and tricks videos. And these are all in a playlist form, go and check those out. This is more for the people that want to see behind the curtain, so to speak. So I've had a lot of people that have requested for me to do a bit more of a deep dive into how my conservatory, which is where I'm growing all my plants, is set up. So this is going to be more for those individuals. As I've mentioned, it's obviously going to be plants around, but I'm going to talk about the realities of growing within a conservatory. And after a year of doing this now, I think I've got a bit of experience and able to kind of say what worked, what didn't work, and maybe give some ideas if you're thinking about setting something up like a planty space within a conservatory, or maybe even a greenhouse. Some of these things are going to be slightly different for a greenhouse, especially if they're unheated greenhouses, but a lot of these things will apply. I'm going to go through a few things, and I've got a trusty list in front of me, and I'm going to talk about the flooring in the space, because believe it or not, that is important. Then we'll talk about if it is a conservatory, what paints you need to be looking at, things like the light coming through, the use of things like net curtains, shade cloths, and also peelable paint for windows. And some of these things might be blowing your mind, I didn't know that peelable paint for windows was a thing. I've only just recently discovered this, but I can talk a bit more at least from what I've seen from that. Then we'll talk about things like ventilation, airflow within the space, bugs and kind of pest management, looking at things like shelving units, electricity to the space if at all possible, and also heating within the winter months. But without further ado, let's dive into things. Okay, so like the previous video that I did for this, it's gonna be a warts and all, purely because I haven't tied it up again. And I'm not gonna sit here and lie to all of you and say that this place is pristine most of the time. It really, really isn't. <laughs> and if you're gonna judge me, go right ahead. But this space works for me, and generally I'm the only one that will come in here. There is a table and chairs, and I... Me and friends can occasionally have coffee or maybe even kind of like snacks, usually in the spring or autumn time because that's the only time where it's kind of bearable in here. Surprise! The reality is a conservatory in the winter generally is a bit too cold for you to sit there and enjoy and in the summer it's blisteringly hot. So I will be picking you up and showing you around different things whilst I'm talking about things. So the first thing that I want to mention is the flooring. I'll pick you up and show you the flooring after I've kind of told you a bit of how I came to decide on the flooring of this space. And I might do most of these sections the same. I'll give you a bit of a talk and then I'll kind of show you an example of what I'm talking about. So for the flooring in my conservatory, I went with vinyl strip flooring. It looks like laminate or it looks like kind of real wood. I've got this throughout the majority of the house and actually just kind of works to kind of come into the conservatory as well, just to keep it consistent in terms of the look and feel of the house, mainly because the conservatory is attached to the house. So what you generally won't see, I might show you briefly when I were kind of panning around, is the conservatory is off the side of what is essentially the dining space. But yeah, so the reason why I went with the vinyl flooring is the following. And there is possibly going to be one other option that you might want to consider using, and that is something like tiles. Also, slight caveat to this, I had the benefit with this conservatory that I was able to set it up before I even moved in. So a lot of the stuff has already been done, and a lot of stuff is still getting done. And some of these things are going to be relatively expensive, but I'm just giving you a bit of a tour of what I've done in here. I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that you have to do any of this or all of this. It's up to you, but I'll tell you why I made the choices that I did. So with the flooring, the reason why I went for the vinyl flooring is I was in a couple of other rental properties. The last rental property had the flooring that I wanted to experience, and I wanted to experience living with vinyl flooring, and it 
doesn't look like the traditional kind of rolls of vinyl that you used to get a long time ago because those were an eyesore at the best of times. But obviously the benefit that you'll get with something like vinyl flooring and specifically, I know that you can get vinyl strip flooring that looks like wood again that's like click. So it's very similar to laminate. I am a bit of a DIY nerd, so I was talking to the person that was laying this down and this is the person who's been working in the industry for a long time. I tend to trust what he says. With the click flooring, he was saying you might come to the same problems that you might do when you're putting in laminate, is that the clicks alone could create a space for humidity or water to go through. And in a conservatory environment, that's important. But essentially the big plus with the vinyl is that I can literally have water pooling on top of the floor for days and there is no problem basically. It's a shame that today is a really, really dry day in the conservatory, so I can't show you this. If between filming this and editing this and posting this online, I do have a really, really humid day, I will take a picture and add it into the video so you can see the actual layer of condensation that is sat on the floor for a whole day at a time, basically, when it is really, really humid in here. <laughs> And this is the, the point I'm trying to make is this floor hasn't buckled under any of this. Same thing if there's things that will drop down, like staining things. As long as you just kind of scrub it away, it will go away. As I said, the only other option I think that would work is possibly tiles, but the grout might be a bit of an issue when you're looking at things like humidity and mold and mildew, basically, if you think about what it's like in a bathroom. I have been exceptionally happy with this. It was worth its money in gold, more so than anything else in this conservatory. This is the one thing that has made a huge difference because if something spills, especially with people, <laughs> people know, people who've got pod and you drop pod and it's that sinking moment of dread that you're gonna be cleaning up pebbles of pod for days on end. True, that doesn't change here. But the difference is with most other flooring systems, if you step on something like one of the pond pebbles, you could potentially scratch the floor. That's not a problem in here, basically, at all. So here you can see some of the flooring. Again, apologies about how messy everything is, but as I said, it's generally quite messy in here. And you can see kind of in the corner there, there is dust debris and everything else. It's not causing any problems. Um, right exactly where I'm standing, all the microphone cables are, was a puddle of water this morning that was probably there since overnight, but there has been no problem whatsoever. So yeah, definitely a floor. And it doesn't look like it's not necessarily a wooden floor. So moving on to the next aspect that I want to talk about, and it is waterproof paint. And specifically, when I was talking to the painter decorators before I moved into the house, I did specifically say if they could paint this with the most waterproof paint that they could get. And they were very clear in telling me that that would not be bathroom and kitchen paint, because yes, that does have a bit of resistance. What they have painted the entirety of the inside of the conservatory is with outdoor waterproof paint, and specifically, I think it's called boat paint so it can actually maintain and withhold. So if the water sits on the actual paint itself, it kind of doesn't seep through the paint, so it's hydrophobic. I'm pretty sure that the paint itself has got some form of an oil substance for it to kind of like not let the water to permeate. That having been said, if you're gonna do anything like this, just a word of warning, especially if you're gonna be painting it yourself, where masks have ventilation open, I'm pretty sure that paint is quite fume heavy. Um, and you will also, the, the problem that you'll get is you'll probably need to do a few coats of it. And I am pretty sure from when I was painting something else with it recently, it does take considerably longer than kind of traditional non kind of emulsion paint. I don't think it's an emulsion paint really, but um, it takes considerable time to dry between coats. So it's a bit of a process. So if you've already got stuff in, so if you've already got plants and you need to move them out in order for you to paint, bear in mind that this could take a, quite a few days, possibly a week, until you've got like a few layers of paint on there and you've left enough time to dry between each one of the layers of paint. I will say, however, and this is a learning experience that I've learned in here, <laughs> is the previous owners of the house, 
there was wood kind of um, on top of, on the side of a window ledge, essentially, it's a wood, wood window ledge. Words are hard. Um, and they've painted over that. That is starting to peel slightly, but, and this is something that I don't know, I don't think I've ever spoken about in here. The only thing really keeping the conservatory aloft at the moment, because it is a wood conservatory, and I hadn't realized when I bought the house and the conservatory with it, that it was in such a bad state of disrepair, especially on the outside, because somebody told me this the other day, and I think it's probably the most accurate thing I've ever heard. One of the most expensive things you're gonna buy in life is a house, and you base it on a few minutes, maybe a couple of visits, and you buy that house. <laughs> um, but, and this was one of the consequences of that, is I hadn't realized that the wood on the outside is rotting. So dealing with that, uh, budget is exceptionally dry or non-existent at this point after a lot of the work that's been done in the last year since buying the house and moving in. Um, so I had to do something to keep the conservatory watertight over the winter. So at the moment, and I don't know whether or not I'm going to be able to take a picture and just edit it in, so you might be able to see this here. <laughs> the only thing keeping the conservatory watertight at the moment is hope, prayer and polyfiller. So it's expanding foam, actually, more specifically. <laughs> There's a lot of places where the wood had really rotted out. So I've added in expanded foam. Don't come for me. I know that that's not what I probably should have done. I did get some advice about getting wood hardener in, peeling everything off, letting the wood hardener in, filling that in, and then painting over it. Do you know how expensive both wood hardener and filler is for wood? And for the sheer grooves of missing wood that I've got, <laughs> it wasn't an option. Um, the conservatory will be getting pretty much replaced in its entirety, hopefully next year. Um, it was going to get done this year, but energy prices, solar panels are much more important at the moment than getting the conservatory fixed, and hopefully the expanding foam will last for another year. But yeah, the point I was trying to make about the paint on the wood on the inside, I think that probably already had some damp damage before because some of that paint is peeling off. So it's less so because of the humidity on the paint and I think more so because the wood inside is damp basically. So it's a bit unfortunate, but as I said, it's gonna get replaced. So hopefully that will be one of the things that gets replaced as will all the windows and everything else like that. But yes, definitely go for one of those types of paints basically. So here you can see what I meant about the paint that's peeling. You can also see the other issue, and this is another reason why you need um, to have waterproof paint. I know it doesn't look great, but um, there's also a lot of mold and mildew that you're gonna need to clean off the actual paint itself. What you're seeing in the corner there is actually little spider webs, and those are actual spiders rather than spider mites. I know I have got a spider mite, satchel there, but that's obviously just to deal with the spider mites itself. Spiders don't bother me, and a lot of the times they will eat the pests that are on the plant, and why would I ever want to discourage that? So the other thing I want to talk about really quickly is the concept of net curtains. So I'm looking at the windows in front of me, they've literally, more or less all of them have got some net curtains. The ones right behind me don't, but there is a fence there's a wooden fence behind it so it doesn't get anywhere near as much light, so I'm less worried about putting net curtains there. The light levels that are coming in from there are relatively low. And talking about light levels, highly, highly would suggest that if you really want to do this thing properly, download a light meter app on your phone. You could buy a device, they are exceptionally expensive, so I'm not telling you to do that. And the light meter from your phone will do an okay enough job to realize what's happening in here. But um, but yeah, so you don't want to be doing that, but definitely use a light meter and check the light levels that are coming into your conservatory or into your greenhouse before you've put on shade cloth and also a net curtain as well. Same thing with that, obviously you've got the, there is a wood fence there, so I know that the light levels weren't that high. The other thing I was gonna say, and I was talking to a few people that have been setting up greenhouses recently, and especially when they're moving certain house plants into greenhouses without giving them any protection, do me a favor if you're gonna do anything like that. Same thing about taking your plants, your house plants, and putting it outside. Grab a light meter on your phone, 
get the reading of where your house plant is in your house and see the light level that is there. So usually, I think on most of these light meters, they're not the best forms of measurements. So you'll be getting lux or you'll be getting foot candles. Go for foot candles if you can. I think par is the correct one. So photo available. I can't remember what the R is. Radiation, maybe. Um, that's the proper measurement, but you need really specialist machinery to be able to kind of pull that, or I think calculations as well potentially. But the foot candles and the lux will give you enough of an indication. So if you see how much you're getting in, and say for example we're looking at 200, 300 foot candles inside the house, take that light measurement and do it outside or do it in your conservatory or in your greenhouse before you put any of the shade cloth or any of the <laughs> net curtains on and have a look at quite how much higher that number is going to be. So there's a lot more light and obviously you get some of the benefits so you can see how well the plants are taken to this but there's a lot of things that I'm doing to it because you're giving them top-down lighting. Another thing to remember about top-down lighting especially in a greenhouse or a conservatory you won't get the atelation, so you won't get the plants leaning towards the lights, which they probably would do if they're just in a regular kind of windowsill in a house, or even kind of grow lights. They're getting light from all around, above and around the sides, but there's a lot more of a chance that they are A, going to get burnt if that light is too high. And the other thing to bear in mind as well with that is that you'll get leaves. If you want things to hang down, so I'm looking at the Esmeraldense. Esmeraldense is a bad example because it won't generally do it, but the Billetia, for instance, you want leaves that are dropping down. You can see that glorious length of them as well, but sometimes with some of these plants, they will move their leaves towards the light. So instead of you having the leaves down and you can see them, they will start lifting upwards from the petiole because the light is coming in from above. So bear that in mind as well. But definitely get something like net curtains in all the way around your windows because you're going to be getting light coming in from all the different angles within your conservatory or greenhouse. And shade cloth. Ha. It's not going to look the prettiest thing in the world, not going to lie. It's just a bit of black netting. I think you can get it in green as well if you want to live your big like army dreams. But yeah, it is kind of necessary and trust me on this, or at least if you want to you can trust me on this. I tried different shade cloth levels because shade cloth is something that a lot of the times uh, nurseries or growers might use on a regular basis and usually th there's percentages of how much light they're blocking out. I think all the way from 10% all the way up to 90%. I don't know if there's a 100% block but you could just put something like paint it so you don't get anything. But yeah, up to 90% light blockage. The interesting thing with that is when I was first doing my research about which one to buy, I was seeing that a lot of these growers, a lot of these people that might be growing in a polytunnel or anything like that, were getting really high numbers, 70% or 90% uh, shade cloth, which is blocking up that much of the light. And I'm just like, oh, that's too much. I'm not getting anywhere near that light in here. I'm in the UK. It's usually cloudy. I'm also on the side of a house. I'm not exposed in the middle of a field. Don't do me. Don't spend money and then realize that what you bought is completely inadequate for what you needed to do. The 30% didn't work. The 50% didn't work. Barring the fact of how long it took me to attach it to the different bits of the conservatory as well. And one of the few benefits of it being wood, it's very easy for me to put in some nails, seal around it so that I'm not allowing moisture in through that nail hole basically. But put nail holes in so I can attach the shade cloths. With an aluminum structure, I know some greenhouses you can put different anchors in and you might be able to tie it in that way, but with a regular conservatory, I don't know. I'm going to go for an aluminum um, conservatory for the next one, so I will definitely be setting things up again in a way that hopefully should work, uh, and I will give you an update if you really want to know. The honorable mention here, and this is something that I haven't tried yet, but it came up recently in conversation, is a thing that you can get. I think it's mainly meant for greenhouses, and it is uh, peelable paint, and it's meant to go on windows. So you can paint that paint on, it blocks a large chunk of that light, and then at the end of the summer, for instance, when the light levels are going to drop down, you can peel that paint off. I have 
not tried this, so I don't know how well it works, how easy it is to peel. I don't know. Um, but maybe something that I'm going to be trying. Had I have known about that, it would have been something that I would have wanted to try, and I probably would have painted the windows so I can avoid the net curtains, potentially. Because again, all of these fabric elements in as well, they create different little issues, and we can talk about them as I show you what I mean now. So you can see the shade cloth and how it's been added on, granted some bits. So the bit here that is doubled up is because I didn't want to buy another shade cloth, and I think this is either the 30 or the 50, so I've doubled it up a bit so it will get as much blockage of light as possible, and I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to see. So right there, that is a 50% shade cloth, and right there is 70 or 90% shade cloth. I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to see a difference. There is a slight colour difference that you might be able to see between the two, but yeah, it is, it's definitely the, the higher level would have been better from day one. I should have just bit, bit the bullet and bought it then. If I pan you up as well, you'll see a fan, and we'll come back to that in a moment. You might be able to see I've added a panel of a neck curtain because there is a gap at the very top because, again, of how the structure is. So, yeah, I didn't have enough to kind of go all the way to the sides, and obviously the fan and the brace for the fan is causing some issues, but your own space might have its own set of challenges. You might be able to see the neck curtains there as well, and they're all the way around. Um, but yeah, not the most attractive thing in the world, but you might be able to see there is more mould and mildew behind the curtains, and the same thing happens between the neck curtain and the ceiling as well. And that is something to remember is sometimes these neck curtains, depending if there's a bit of a gap there as well, will actually trap some of the heat there as well. So that is something that you might want to bear in mind. The other thing I wanted to mention really briefly, and for the people that have been around and they've seen the conservatory tour before, and I will link it up here if you haven't already seen it, I would assume you probably have if you're wanting to see a kind of continuation, but it is the matter of humidity in both a greenhouse and a conservatory. So the humidity situation is going to be one that's going to surprise you, and you're going to have to... Everything you've learned about growing houseplants in a house, you might have to flip it on its head, basically. And I will show you what the reading on my humidity meter is giving for right now, basically, after this section of the video. But essentially, in a conservatory and in a greenhouse, a lot of the time, you're going to be getting very high humidity without having done very much, especially if there's quite a few plants in, basically. So it's the whole point of a greenhouse and a conservatory is it traps some of that heat and some of that humidity in, which means that on average in the summer in here, without me doing very much at all, it can hover around 90 to 92 percent humidity at its peak. So <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> something to bear in mind. So for the eagle-eyed amongst you who have seen previous videos, I have got a dehumidifier in the conservatory, and I'll explain how I run that in a moment. But yeah, I need a dehumidifier in here. It's a shame because I had the beautiful, what was it, the Levoit, looking at it, it's on the floor, it's retired at the moment. My beautiful Levoit humidifier, which was spectacular for indoors. It raised the humidity enough without it being too, too high, but just enough that all the plants were happy. It had directional kind of fog or steam that came out of it. It was great. Has not been used since I've moved everything into the conservatory, because there is zero point of adding more humidity in here, which will cause more problems, basically. <laughs> just to also clarify, when it hits 90% humidity in here, and that's the point I was making about the floor having condensation on it, it kind of rains. Again, the shade cloth and everything else is happening. You do get condensation that sits on the ceiling, and occasionally it drops. So kind of get a bit of like internal rain. Ta-da! I am the rain man. Not really. <laughs> but it is it is a reality that you need to deal with. At the moment, it's the daytime, so I've got the conservatory door and the one window that only opens outwards at an angle. 
when I do my own conservatory and this gets replaced, the, the, the ventilation in the window situation is going to be a lot better than what it is at the moment. But I'm dealing with what I've got at the moment. So with that being said, at the moment, the humidity in here is, and this is something that's going to generally worry some people at the moment, and I can tell you, and I will show you on the reader as well. It's 46% humidity, and it's actually gone up a bit now since I've been in here. When I first came into the conservatory before I started filming, it was 40% humidity, which would make a lot of people panic slightly. And the heat level is 30 degrees Celsius. And just to clarify, on some of the warmest days of the year where there's a lot of sunlight that's happening today, there's kind of clouds around, so the light's going in and out. And again, apologies for it being be, being washed out all the time. I do not know how to fix that. If you are a videoing genius, then you know how I can minimize the kind of shade and light that I get because I'm sitting essentially what would be outside, exposed to the sun. Please do let me know in the comments down below. I would love you forever. But with the situation in here, you need to kind of bear in mind that it will drop considerably. The humidity and the, the temperature will rise a lot. Warmest day of the year here, I think I hit 45 to 48 degrees Celsius. I tell you something, it's unbearable basically. Um, so you might also see when I'm filming during these warmer and sunnier months of the year, if I'm a bit groggy when I'm filming, do apologize, it tends to be at the crack of dawn and I'm usually an early riser anyway, so I'm usually up between 5 and 6 a.m., just naturally because, yeah, fun times. Uh, so I'll usually be filming around 7 or 8 in the morning. And again, it helps because it's a lot cooler in here and I can film quite comfortably at the moment. <laughs> it's the middle of the day and it's uncomfortable, to say the least. So yeah, it does get really warm. The humidity does drop. The flip side of that, and this is the point I'm trying to make in terms of you worrying that the humidity is going to drop. Yes, it does drop dr throughout the day, especially if I've got the windows and door open. You would assume that because it's warm and sunny and summery that you might get some humidity coming in. That's not been my experience in here. But nighttime, when I've closed all the windows and doors and all these things, and it's kind of a closed environment again, the same thing would happen with a uh, greenhouse, the humidity will bump up to the 90% humidity that we were talking about. And none of the plants really seem to struggle with that change because they are getting some high levels of humidity for a long part of the day or night, more specifically. That also extends to bug issues, essentially. So I'll talk a bit more about pests in a minute, basically. But you would assume if it gets really dry, there is a higher chance of spider mites. Eh, kind of, but kind of not really. Not at least, it hasn't been my experience. And just so you can see that I'm not lying to you, it's actually just jumped up to 49% and 30 degrees. You can see the highest temperature recorded since I've reset that timer recently is 38 degrees and the lowest humidity is 31. The other thing that is a godsend, and especially if you're a bit of a techie and you like kind of gadgety things, I think that is called the Govi thermometer or humidity reader as well. It does both. It connects to the Wi-Fi, it's a smart device, and it will also, you can set up alerts to your phone if the humidity or the temperature goes above or below a certain preset that you've got. So that's kind of cool. It's slightly pricey. I'll add it down in the description below, a link to it. But really, really been quite a cool little device. Let me see if I can bring it. It's just a little box, basically, that you can just hang somewhere. Let's briefly touch on ventilation. I did talk about the windows, the doors, everything that's open. No lot of people worry about bugs potentially coming in. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, you probably will get some bugs that fly in, especially if you don't have a bug screen. Bug screens, at least where I am, they're not particularly expensive. You can get them relatively cheaply from places like Amazon. I've got one over the door. It's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it doesn't need to be. Um, I don't have one over the window because it's a bit of a weird kind of angled opening as the window for some bizarre reason as well. Bug screens, those temporary ones for windows are more expensive than a door one, which is more fabric. I don't understand. But, uh, um, but yeah, that does help. And to be fair, I didn't open the wind the, the door last summer and I'm kicking myself for not having bought the £10 
bug screen and just opening that up because it's really helped bring the temperature down. The temperature was exceptionally high in here last summer, still is, but it's a bit more manageable now. The window has never had a bug screen in it and I've never really had a problem with the occasional, I've had one bumblebee that came in at the beginning of the season and I was able to kind of gently coax the bumblebee out. Um, but yeah, just something to bear in mind. You need to give as much ventilation as possible. With greenhouses, especially if you're just getting into greenhouses, there are automatic uh, vent openers, which are really, really cool, actually. I put one recently on my greenhouse and I didn't realize, I'm just like, is it going to need battery? Is it going to need electric? I don't have electric, at least, in the greenhouse. No, it's kind of cool. It's kind of to do with metals expanding. You set what temperature you want it to start opening and it will auto open automatically and close as well. The one thing I will say about things like ventilation, doors, windows, all these things, there is a slight limitation to them, even with the automatic vent opener from uh, that you would put into a greenhouse. You need to keep an eye on these things. Obviously, security is a big thing, so do it when you're in the house. You're going to unfortunately have to close these things if you're leaving the house for your own safety and security or your property's safety and security, which means by default the temperature and the humidity is going to rise again. But it is what it is, and if you've done enough with the shade cloths and the or the peelable paint or even the net curtains, at least the light and the heat isn't going to get too too high in here as well. I'll come on to fans in just a moment, but yeah, you definitely you can't get around it. Basically, you need to do this. Uh, Keep an eye as well, even if you're in the house for heavy rains, you might want to close things again. You won't be able to do it with the automatic vent. It will stay open, it will close on its own. I think there is ways that you can unscrew it, but trust me, <laughs> at least in the UK, if you had to go outside and unscrew your like automatic vent opener every time it rained, you'd be doing that most days, so it's fine. Um, but yeah, same thing goes as well if there's really, really strong kind of gale force winds, at that point definitely go and unpatch the, the vent because it might not close fast enough and you might end up like losing a window or a structural damage to your greenhouse, definitely go in. If you know that it's going to happen and you're well aware and there's weather warnings and all these things, please do and please go and do that. Same thing goes windows and doors, close them obviously. There you go, you can see a bug screen. It's not the prettiest thing in the world. It doesn't need to be. You can see also I've overlaid it with some net curtains just to make sure that if the screen's uh, little holes are too big that the bugs won't come in. You can see the window that is open with a slight angle right there at the back. Um, that just has a net curtain over it. And it does probably deter some of the bugs from coming in, but definitely, definitely something that is needed and has been really useful. Coming on to the topic of fans and air circulation around your space. The windows and the doors are going to do something for it, but remember if you've got net curtains, you've got bug screens, you're kind of blocking some of that air from coming in as well. And unless you've got kind of gale force winds and you've got everything open and it's whooshing around your space, it's not enough air circulation that's happening around the plant. And what you will get in a situation like a greenhouse or a conservatory, because of the high humidity at times, and because of the high heat, you can get mildew or powder mildew and all these things that you really don't want to be getting in your environment. So having constant air moving around is going to be a good thing. What you do to achieve this is up to you, basically. At the moment, and I'm trying to see, there's one, two, three, four, five, there's a ceiling fan as well. There's five fans going at any given time in this conservatory, winter and summer, not just the summer, because the, the issue will still exist in the winter. I, this is warm enough in the winter that if the air didn't move, it causes an issue, basically. I learned this the hard way when I was first starting off with my plants and I got one of those... Um, plastic greenhouses. Hopefully you know what I mean by that, the ones with the zippy kind of plastic clear cover that you could put over it. Didn't know anything about ventilation or about air movement at that point. Closed everything up, went for holidays. The plants that survived did okay in terms of it was pretty much a terrarium environment. Because there was no airflow, I probably lost about a third to half of the plants that were in there because of mold and mildew, basically. Not ideal. 
Um, ironic enough, I could have got away with it if I just cracked the, um, the zippy door a bit, basically. It probably wouldn't have had quite as many losses, but for how long I went away, I probably would have had some. But definitely airflow, air circulation would be good. If you do have a conservatory, without a shadow of a doubt, I would say put in a ceiling fan. People that have been here for a while will know. My big plants, when I move them around, just be aware that you might decapitate a tall plant when you're moving it around. Just just have some awareness of the fan up there. Uh, I've not done it yet, touch wood. I say yet, because it's going to happen and I'm okay with it. <laughs> but yeah, definitely something like air circulation would be key. And you want to get air moving at different levels of your conservatory or greenhouse, especially if you've got shelves and you've got things high and you've got things mid and you've got things low. You want to make sure that there is circulation happening on all these things. It won't do you any good if you've just got circulation going at the bottom layer because up here nothing's moving. So just make sure that you've got air circulation going in different places. Also, we are talking about plants here. Some plants don't like too much movement around them. So a lot of alocasias generally do not like that. I'm also looking to see me to kind of like quickly shift there. There's a bit of gusty wind that's happening outside and I can see the Monstera Albo, which is attached with a janky support stick, not to the pot, but to the shelf. Because uh, that has decided to drop off that shelf at least four times in the last few weeks. So that is keeping it up at the moment, but it's still wobbling. Uh. Makes me a bit nervous. But um, yeah, I would say with air circulation, make sure that you've got it on different levels. Make sure that the plant that is getting the brunt of that gust of wind that's happening from the fans can take it. But even the plants that generally won't like it too, too much, some of the ferns won't necessarily like it, some of the allocations and collocations don't like being jostled too much. I have not had any of these problems actually with most of my plants. Um, the other thing as well that you will get some benefit if there is a tiny bit of air movement, you t you tend to get slightly stronger root system as well. Because if you think about how plants will be growing in nature, they don't have the benefit of fans and controlled environments and all these things. You will get really, really windy days and the plant will then put energy into the roots. You probably don't want that because you want to be putting energy towards the foliage, but occasionally it is good for them to send some energy down to the roots, especially after they've been established because they get a stronger root system. It also means a stronger plant up top. So I'll give you a bit of a quick tour of the fan situation. The one that you're seeing in front of me, which is off at the moment, is the biggest fan that I have that's a floor fan. It's not on the highest setting, it's actually on the lower setting, but it does oscillate around the room and this gets the mid to high level plants. Uh, I'm not going to lie, I am sweltering with that not being on, but if I do have that on, all of you lovely peeps will not be able to hear me because there'll be so much background noise because the fan will keep blowing into the microphone. But then you can see another little fan there, and I'll pan you around again, and hopefully this isn't too nauseating for some people. There is a small fan there, and there's another, uh, meant to be a desk fan, that's sitting on the floor, but it's getting a lot of different levels but definitely want something like circulation. I've also, it's no surprise that that floor fan is in front of that door that is open because it's also bringing in some of the fresh air that's blowing in through the door. And just so you can see it again, there is a ceiling fan as well. That is the last fan that's kind of moving air around. It serves a dual purpose because in the summer, it kind of helps move some of the cool air. In the winter, I change the rotation, which means that it does make a bit of a difference in here when it comes to the warmth level, especially in the winter months. The one thing I will say about the ceiling fan is if you can get one with a light, do try to get that. I made a mistake with that one because I can't get anything other than a tiny light bulb in there. The next one will have it won't be the most glorious modern thing, which I would like it to be, or at least really, really vintage rather than something that's a bit 70s and 80s tacky with the you know the one I'm talking about with the multiple light rosettes on it but I might have to go with something like that because the one thing I've learned is in the winter even in something like a conservatory it does benefit with some of the stronger grow light bulbs so I can't do any of that with this one but in the future when I'm going to replace that I will probably be doing that right let's talk pest management in a conservatory and in a greenhouse 
especially if you're going to use a greenhouse to vacation your houseplants outside for the winter, for the summer. For the winter, ideally, you would need a heated greenhouse. If you don't have a heated greenhouse, a couple of things that I've learned online, and there's much better videos you can go and watch about this, you can create a bit of a, a heat sink store by having a black plastic bin filled with water in a place that gets the most amount of light during the winter days. That kind of traps some of that heat in, and when the heat drops at night in the greenhouse, it releases some of that heat that's stored into it. How fast or how efficiently, I'm not 100% sure, but it did make a difference when I didn't have it, and when I did have it, it's not a huge difference. You're talking about one or two degrees Celsius up, but it's still something, and it's not energy that you have to pay for in any way or form. In the conservatory, I'm lucky that this is plumbed in, so this has got standard uh, radiators like I have around the house that comes off the boiler. So I would have liked a few more radiators in here, and when this gets redone, I will add a few more, and then at least I can kind of play around with them in here. In an ideal world, I would like the conservatory's heating to be separate from the rest of the house, because the rest of the house is on a nest heating or a thermostat, so things switch on and off. And generally at night, I don't want to be boiling when I'm falling asleep in the rest of the house, so the temperature drops. But obviously in the winter in here, if it drops, it drops a lot. But I do have a solution with that, which unfortunately, especially uh, based on how expensive electric is getting at the moment, is an electric heater in here for the winter months. And I know <laughs> I'm talking about this whilst I'm wearing short sleeves, because it is 30 degrees still in here. But it's important, both for the greenhouse and the conservatory, you're going to need some way to heat it for the winter months, because your two big stresses on the warm months and the cold months, the warm months is going to be the light and the heat and the drop in the potential humidity. In the winter, your humidity is going to be high. You definitely need the circulation going, because otherwise you're going to get the kind of mold and mildew happening again. But if your temperatures drop, be very, very careful. When I first moved in here and I didn't do anything because I thought the radiators were enough, was the only time that I nearly lost the Esmeraldens behind me to cold damage and a couple of other plants as well. And it doesn't take very long at all in the winter. So just bear that in mind. I have found I didn't even attempt to put something like a fan heater in here because it would dry out the air too, too much. Also, I don't want that much of an element exposed to this much of humidity. I did have a convection heater that was working in here. It wasn't the most efficient thing in the world. So I have now moved to an electric oil heater, and I'll show you in a minute, which does have both a thermostat that I can set the temperature to and also a timer. So in the winter, what I will do, especially because, as I, as I mentioned, the rest of the heating in here is done by the central heating of the house. The electric heater only kicks in after the heating switches off. So it kind of balances out. So there's always as much of a stable temperature as possible. The thermometer that I showed you a moment ago, the digital one, works really well in the winter for that level as well because it will give me um, a notification on my phone if the temperatures drop too much and I can act accordingly if I need to just bump up the heat slightly on the radiator then I can do that and it does give you that flexibility if it's connected just to the main central house heating it's slightly limited because your plants might want to stay warm but you also don't want to roast in your own house so I haven't found a better way around this in an ideal world, and when I have an awful lot of money to spend and I can buy a different house, I would like something like a ground source heat pump. And I know that does consume some energy, but at least then to be able to maintain that temperature. I have seen some awesome YouTube videos, have a search for them online, especially for unheated greenhouses if you are starting from scratch, where you can use kind of the, I think it's geothermal energy, by running pipes and things like that. It's a very involved process, but if you are into your DIY and you want to attempt that, those things look exceptionally cool. And then potentially you could have an unheated greenhouse with that going into it, which doesn't heat it necessarily, but it means that you've got more stable temperatures in there because it's pulling in from the earth's temperature and it's almost free. There's, as I said, there's a bit of a cost to run the pump, I think, which is electricity, but it's not that bad, basically. So you can see there what I mean by the oil electric 
radiator and just to say it's got a thermostat and it's got um, a timer on it as well. And you can also see the radiator that is attached along one of the walls. And what you might be able to see right there in the corner behind the cables there, that bit there, I didn't need it. I used it for the first couple of weeks that I was here. You can add some water in that and it will release um, humidity into the space. Really, really unneeded, but I thought I needed it when I first moved in. Complete and utter waste of money. Briefly touch on shelving units, but you've seen these behind me. I have always found the um, paint coated metal shelves that you can kind of adjust the height to where you want the shelf to actually be the best ones in here because with the level of humidity that's constantly in here I wouldn't even want to attempt putting something like wood even if you've treated it there is a very high chance that you're gonna get water damage on uh, plastic probably wouldn't take the weight of most of my plants so just for me the, the god awful kind of like metal shelving units for the win. I'll wrap it up with pests ending on a high note. Um, so pest management in an environment like this has to be proactive rather than reactive. You've got too many things that are touching. There's always gonna be a warm environment in here. So the pest pressures might get a bit more in the summer, but they're pretty much there all year round because I'm keeping the temperature at a certain level. And yeah, so it's preemptive rather than anything else. So you will generally see the spider mite satchels that I've got on there. Biological control is my friend. It is easier to do, ironically enough, in the winter because the windows and doors are closed. So it's a bit more of an enclosed space, especially for any flying predator insects. That's good. In the summer with the windows and doors having to be open, even with the bug screen, I wouldn't get flying predatory insects in here because they can probably escape and it's costing you money. So yeah, preemptive would be ideal if you can. So anything you can do, so SB plant invigorator is one of them, I think. Uh, anything to do with the predatory insects would be really, really good because bugs can grow at an exponential rate here. The other thing to bear in mind especially if you're opening things up, greenhouse or conservatories will have the same issue with this. You will have other types of pests. So I mentioned the bumblebee that came in here that I had to kind of get out. Um, if you don't have things that are screened off, it's not happened to me yet. I still think it's going to happen because I've got a lot of very opinionated birds outside. There's a lot of blackbirds that give me lip on a regular basis. <laughs> I'm pretty sure one of them is going to end up in here somehow. And that's going to be fun trying to get it out of here. But slugs, snails, greenhouses, conservatories, they can get in. That's an issue. Those are things that you generally wouldn't have to look out for in a house, but you need to keep an eye out for them. And things like um, isopods or wood lice. Arguably, it's something that I use in my terrariums, and they tend to be called custodians because they will deal with certain kind of soil issues. I don't necessarily mind them too much, but you'll get things like spiders, things like that as well. So these are other things that you're going to have to be aware of in a space like this, especially if you're opening windows and doors on a regular basis, even if you've got bug screens. But yeah, I think that is everything that I wanted to say. This is probably a very long video looking at it as well. I do apologize. Hopefully you found it useful and interesting. I will hopefully be trying to put some chapters on this. I didn't realize it was going to go on for quite so long. Um, and yeah, I know it's not a traditional video with looking at a whole bunch of plants, but there's a lot of you that were asking me about my setup and how I've done certain things. Messy as always. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed. If you've got any questions, comments, please feel free to put them down in the comments below and I'll try to get back to you. And yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.